Good morning, uh, everyone. Welcome to the second day of uh, Marginal Ecologies Conference of the School of Human Ecology at Ambedkar University. Um, the first session today is on urban wetlands, uh, the functions, values, and restoration. Uh, the panel itself has been put together by uh, Dr. Suresh Babu, who is also a panelist. So, <laughs> so he'll give you a, a, a more in-depth sort of rationale for, for this panel. What I would just want to say is a few things from my own sort of understanding or reading of this issue from sort of urban planning, geography sort of background. There is a lot of interesting research these days uh, on, on borders, right, on borders. And usually it is thought in terms of national borders, uh, territorial borders, administrative borders, and so on. Uh, but I think one can uh, do or create a very interesting research agenda around the borders between land and water. Right, in terms of whether, and the same sorts of questions that you ask in terms of territorial borders about their sanctity, about the way they are maintained, about the way uh, either side of the two sort of transgresses those boundaries and, 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 and those uh, policing, uh, that you can see definitely in terms of waterscapes of the city. We see that every year in and around the Yamuna, if you, and we know that because we are in Kashmiri Gate. Um, so much of land is inundated uh, as water is released by the barrages or by the authorities from the barrages. And this, of course, has a longer history. People have lived in flood prone areas, have adapted to it. Um, and just an aside, another colleague of ours, Dr. Uh, Praveen Singh, is going to talk on Monday at Nehru Memorial on precisely this, on adaptation to uh, adaptation strategies of people in flood prone areas. Um, so it's an interesting area of research and uh, and a lot of uh, interest therefore is um, is being uh, channeled to this this question. Now usually though wetlands and issues around uh, wetlands are considered regionally right in term, and, and questions human ecology sorts of questions around livelihoods emerge therefore right? because people are dependent on these spaces they have customary or other sorts of rights over these areas um, but what happens when we bring or uh, take that up or take uh, take up wetlands in terms of cities or in the context of cities uh, traditionally how, what happens is that in planning terminologies if you look at the master plan it would either be green or blue in these areas. Right? If it is blue, then the current thinking for some time in planning circles has been to create or to go for some sort of uh, waterfront development. We know what it means. There is a whole waterfront on Sabarmati. If you go to Ahmedabad, you can see it means basically putting a lot of concrete around the river, making it beautiful, pretty, quote unquote. Uh, and you bring in people uh, for recreational sorts of purposes. Right? So people can have their walks. Uh, I'm not saying it's wrong or bad to do that, but it's just that that's one way of thinking about water. If it turns out to be green, then there's a separate way of thinking about it. Then you create them as parks, right? And which again has recreational sorts of values. So if you see this one lake in uh, North Delhi, the Bhalaswa Lake, right, it has Partly, it is there is some notion of developing it at, for boating. Uh, then there is a golf course next to it that DDA has created. Again, this blue-green sort of dynamics in urban planning. They work around recreation. But the interesting thing about us here is in a context like Delhi and generally in cities of the global south, there are two interesting things that happen despite all these strategies. One is that there are several sorts of unarticulated or uh, users and uses that still continue to be in these spaces and use these spaces for other ends. And we know for fuel wood collection, uh, for energy needs, for fishing perhaps, and for several other sorts of uses, which you won't find in developed countries. Second, our capacity of the local state itself is fairly limited in terms of policing these, uh, these categories and the master plan zonings. Uh, so, the, so the actually existing wetlands, therefore, are a combination or a complex sort of a, a system where you have many agents, many agencies, multiple interests, multiple uses and functions happening together. And, uh, and it's a question for, uh, for researchers of human ecology 
from both dimensions, from social science as well as from uh, the sciences, to make sense of, to, again to use my favorite word these days, disentangle <laughs> these various interests and, uh, and, and to see exactly what's going on. And then, and then put together uh, perhaps a more democratic uh, sort of arrangement and assemblage uh, in these very places. That, that, that keeps in mind social justice issues, but also, um, but also ecological concerns. So with that, I'll just uh, invite our, 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 um, our first speaker. I'll just introduce them briefly uh, as I invite them. Our first speaker is Dr. K.S. Gopi Sundar, who most of us know very well. He's, uh, he's been uh, involved with programs at AUD. He's the director of program Sariscape of the International Crane Foundation. And he's also a scientist with the Nature Conservation Foundation. Um, so Gopi. Thanks for inviting uh, thanks for the invitation for this workshop and uh, of course last minute I was told that there is actually so what we've uh, uh, Rohit has already covered a lot of the aspects that relate to urban wetlands and I think there are key characteristics that uh, we need to uh, look at and keep in mind when we look at an, a system that we have labeled as an urban wetland so many of you who are in urban ecology may know that there is there was a lot of fighting or a lot of dispute or a lot of uh, a lack of under a clear understanding as to what the term wetlands mean. So you can uh, you can sort of imagine that there is uh, no real generic uh, acceptance of a definition for the term urban wetlands. So wetlands, but now we've come to a stage where uh, we've realized that there are more simple definitions possible of uh, a complex system like wetlands. And now it's more or less largely accepted that wetlands need to have two components. One is needs to have hydric soil, which means soil capable of holding water for a particular amount of time. And as Rohit mentioned, it transitions between wetness and dryness. And the second component that people have decided is really necessary for something to become a wetland is aquatic vegetation. And that sort of takes away from uh, the discussion and arguments related to things like depth of water, how long the water has to stay, uh, whether it is flowing or non-flowing, and whether uh, there are boundaries uh, that should be associated with something that we can call as a wetland. So these two simple parameters have now allowed us to enlarge a much more holistic discussion and a much more, uh, as Rohit said, disentangling the complexity that surrounds any ecosystem, particularly when it gets into uh, a, a place like an urbanized area. So wetlands and waterways have actually been the reason for be where civilizations began. And as we know from several examples, wetlands and water are also responsible for loss of civilizations when we don't manage them very well. So as far as natural resources go, we should keep in mind that about 50% of the global human population are now centered in urban areas. And this number uh, in the next 30 to 40 years is slated to become two-thirds of the global human population. So clearly what started off as uh, an academic exercise looking at urban areas and trying to see academic differences between more naturalized areas and urban areas has now become more or less uh, a sort of progression where we are now looking to survive, improve our lives, and uh, therefore cater to the vast majority of human population on the planet. And wetlands by their being have a huge variety of uses. Uh, and what we have now come to sort of label them as services because it's become anthropocentric. The first one, of course, which led to human civilization, and in fact, most of the animals on the planet using wetlands and water as a whole is food production, and that uh, includes the wide gamut of domesticated crops all the way to stuff that is produced seasonally. And then water supply, which is very, very key to, an, uh, to uh, a wetland which is in an urban setting. The lesser known things which are more invisible, but perhaps which are f uh, very, very interesting in terms of wetlands, which have now sort of come to the fore in an urban setting, are the regulatory things that happen. So one is nutrient regulation. There is a huge amount of flux, particularly in seasonal wetlands, where uh, you have the wetland completely drying up all the way to being completely flooded uh, that you have very close to your campus itself. And the second one is the soil and sediment regulation. So these. Uh, things are really impacted and we know much less about them in urban areas than we probably should be knowing. Also, they now uh, are very, very well understood to be uh, regulatory in terms of preventing or reducing disturbance and natural hazards. So flooding is uh, one regime and then we now know that uh, coastal wetlands can also prevent or reduce the, uh, uh, the damage due to phenomena like tsunamis and uh, other things. And so wetlands have sort of come to the fore when they have uh, realized that they're really protecting human interests and human lives. Also, habitat and biodiversity is a component that I'll focus quite a lot on because that's where my background is. 
And then where they occur in urban areas or close to people or are uh, almost entirely taken over for people use, recreation has come out to the fore as being a very, very important component of a use of urban wetlands. And finally, uh, particularly in India where we are very used to seeing uh, images, very powerful images of people standing in water and praying to the sun god with, uh, you know, with uh, letting out the water from their hands, we have very strong cultural values and uh, sort of related also to aesthetic values that we ascribe to wetlands. And these may or may not exist in urban wetlands depending on the location and geography. <coughs> And some of these values, if you look at them as on a puro, purely anthropocentric way, can actually be very, very high in terms of estimating it crudely in economic terms. For example, in terms of storm production value, the East Coast wetlands of uh, the United States have been estimated to be providing a service of uh, up to $5 million per year per square kilometer of wetland. That is an enormous amount of value which perhaps even some industries will not be able to give if you look at per square kilometer value. And in, a, in developed countries, uh, they value and use wetlands very differently. Uh, uh, urban wetlands in Europe, for example, are largely looked at in, uh, in terms of biota that exist in urban wetlands, whereas the paradigm has shifted greatly in the United States where they also examine uh, the, uh, by, by through the lenses of social sciences. And they also view them quite explicitly for the ecosystem fluxes and processes that occur in urban uh, wetland areas. And, and so therefore, things like recreation and hunting form a vast majority of the economic accrual in those areas. And in the US, it can be up to $3,000 per acre of wetland. And that's an enormous amount of uh, valuation. And these valuations have occurred in the uh, 1980s and 1990s. So current valuations may be, of course, much, much, much higher. So before I go on to the other uh, sort of theoretical constructs that will help people like us who are multidisciplinary and who are academic in nature and who are very interested in questions, there are a few key differences between what makes an ecosystem different when it comes into contact with uh, an entirely anthropomorphized region like an urban area. So if you look at a natural wetland, then the approach that's usually taken to understand them, to view them, and to study them, and also to conserve them, is what is called as a watershed approach, because they're all water-related. So it could be standing in itself, in and of itself, uh, as it occurs in the high Himalayas, or in many other uh, wetlands like in Rajasthan. Or it could be part of a very elaborate uh, riverine ecosystem, like we have the Yamuna floodplains and the Gangetic floodplains, which are amongst the most productive wetland areas in the world. But in an urban setting, that is transformed entirely to suit urban settings, and most of the approaches that we take for wetlands in urban areas are municipality based because it is based on what kind of uh, laws and what kind of regulations adhere to either retaining the wetland, using it, or removing it. And in the natural areas, the other key difference between the two is in the natural areas, the ecological characteristics are fairly readily uh, identifiable and these ecological characteristics are primary to those wetlands. Whereas the shift to the urban wetlands are almost entirely complete in that the ecological functions uh, reduce in importance and in fact in most of the areas it disappears to being replaced by the kind of human values uh, that it has. And there has been considerable difficulty in uh, trying to rectify this and also in trying to measure it in both sociological terms or also what seems to be uh, at the outsets to be straightly, fairly straightforward like economic terms. And that is a very, very fertile ground for investigation, fertile grounds for uh, you know, projects and uh, dissertations and theses, and also long-term work, because that's an area where you can really have a huge impact, particularly if you want to work on urban wetlands and try and take a, a holistic view. Natural wetlands, the, the disturbance regimes are in fact more critical than we give credit for. If you look at the Indian system, the uh, wetland ecosystems like, say, the famous ones like Bharatpur, Chilka, Bitarkanika, and all of that, they are unfortunately managed to just be retained as water bodies. And that's sort of what we do in the cities as well, because initially it started out to be a water resource, a uh, clean water resource. And as you know, historically, battles were fought over tanks and irrigation tanks. And, and in the south, you have a whole system of uh, interconnected uh, uh, water tanks, which have now become very, very important wetlands ecologically as well that sort of determined whether or not a kingdom succeeded. And so the location of the wetland sometimes determined the location of how a kingdom was built because it was a very primary resource. <coughs> uh, 
The natural regimes that I'm talking about is, for example, if you look at the Gangetic floodplains and the subtropical area floodplains, it's in fact very important for, those, for many of these wetlands to dry out. And that is something we don't understand because these are evolved over millennia. And so you have plant species, animal species, and a lot of other uh, taxa that are evolved for actually this periodicity of drying out and uh, wetness. You might have seen examples of the Amazon uh, portrayed in, in their uh, starkness on television because a huge vast wet systems becomes an, uh, a series of uh, in sometimes interconnected but uh, most of the time discrete small water bodies across uh, an entire continent. So these are systems where natural disturbances are actually natural and they are in fact necessary to maintain the, uh, the uh, functions that they have. But when you come to an urban system, the natural disturb disturbances are not only less understood or even forgotten, but they may also have become very, very impossible to retain. And as Suresh will point out, I suppose, uh, also becomes impossible to restore many of them. <coughs> I talked about an invisible uh, function, which is nutrients. Nutrients limitations and the cycles of nutrients that occur because of the seasonality and because of the disturbance uh, regimes are in fact the norm that occur in wetland areas. And they are very, very important to determine the course of uh, sort of evolution of the habitat that a wetland might become. If you read uh, classical succession studies, the sort of simpli simplified understanding is that the wetland is how it begins and then you have trees forming and then it finally becomes a, wet, uh, a forest. That is now uh, known not to be very true because there are wetlands that remain as wetlands for millennia and they just keep changing in the nature of the wetlands that they are. And so these uh, limitations and cycles can actually progress across millennia. In the urban system, the wetlands are unique in that there is usually a concentration of certain nutrients, a complete absence of other nutrients, and they are almost impossible to reduce because of the functionality of urban areas. And the wetlands then become what is known as sinks or storage areas for those nutrients that completely changes their ecology, and in doing so also completely changes the way in which we view them and use them. Uh, if you view them as habitats, in the natural settings, the habitat patches vary enormously in both size and connectivity in natural systems. Because if you follow a river, then you know that there are a lot of connections during the monsoon, particularly in the northern Indian setting. And in the dry season, you know that many of them dry out and some of them become discrete. Whereas in an urban area, most urban wetlands anywhere in the world are characterized by largely being small. And you may know that from seeing the uh, wetland areas in uh, Delhi itself, where we have now almost entirely lost out, lost out large areas, except perhaps uh, Najafgarh and Okhla, which are sort of on the, border, uh, on the borders of the city. If they had been in the center of the city, we might have lost them faster. And uh, now they are still fight. We are still trying to fight to keep the nature of the wetland going. And connectivity is often permanently lost because of concretization and because of the way in which urban areas are built up, which is for human use. Climate and microclimates of a particular wetland in the natural systems affect the regional geography. So a wetland in Bihar is more or less similar in its functions and its being of a wetland in, say, Uttar Pradesh with mild variations because of where it occurs. And a wetland in Karnataka may be very, very different from a wetland in lower Nepal simply because of the geography. In urban areas, what happens is that the urban settings determine what happens to the climate and microclimate of the wetlands. This is sort of obvious. But the thing to remember is that both the climate and the microclimate is significantly altered from, what you, from the geographically based expectations or the climate based expectations that you will have for a natural setting. And this sort of leads to the next one, which is really key to maintaining it as a wetland, which is hydrology. And hydrology in the wild is a factor of uh, geology, climate, region, and physiology of what happens in a much, much larger scale. Whereas in urban settings, partly because they've been uh, sort of fragmented and they've been reduced to smaller areas, hydrology becomes hugely altered. And not just in amounts, but also the flow rates and the sources of water can be changed entirely as we are seeing in Okla today where most of the water is uh, really from sewage and very, very little natural water comes into these areas. So as the Cities now become more and more prominent in our, for the urban settings. We have now developed a vast range of definitions and a vast range of theories to try and combat and to live with the settings that we've created for ourselves. And urban wetlands are, have not escaped that uh, gamut. And, uh, and sort of a broader philosophy that is sort of evolving is something that's referred to as urban metabolism. And that is quite interestingly is defined as the sum total of technical and socio-economic processes that occur in cities 
resulting in growth, energy production, and waste. So by definition, we are now beginning to develop analogies in which we can live in that no longer have direct connections with the natural world. So if you look at this definition, you have energy production and waste, and in that, we may consider things like parks for recreation, we may consider wetlands for dumping waste. And so the natural elements of these systems seem to have been almost entirely lost, even in the way that we think about how cities are planned, except for a small group of people who are, of course, ecologically inclined. <coughs> so the key characteristics of, of wetlands, and in fact, most natural things that occur in urban areas are hugely modified. Both the land, water, and air components of it is mo vastly modified, as is the ecology and the species. And then there are enhancement of specific pathways. So the nutrient exchange stuff that could happen in the wild has become fairly limited and has become fairly concentrated. And so urban wetlands end up mostly to be eutrophied areas or uh, something that has become uh, largely rich in phosphates and largely rich in stuff that leads to algal blooms and then leads to sort of what we would call the death of the uh, natural ecology of the wetland. And then finally, there is also the elimination and reduction of other pathways that then become key to how we view these wetlands in terms of uh, uh, what needs to be done to continue to retain them should that become part of the planning process as uh, Rohit sort of alluded to. So uh, the loss of wetlands uh, is sort of final because of urbanization and in India we have a very unique scenario where we have both urbanization and also uh, intensification of agriculture that is occurring at massive la landscape scales that is leading to loss of wetlands across the entire region. And this has uh, already happened in the West where the US has lost 50% of the wetlands as agriculture and urbanization enhanced. And now in India, we are beginning to go through that, saved perhaps only in the North uh, because of the monsoon, which is uh, uh, such a huge amount of water that we still do find wetland areas, even seasonal wetlands sort of remaining. So the location of where AUD is located and where all of us are located are quite fascinating to look at uh, uh, wetland systems in how they have affected us in the past and how uh, we may continue to use them in the future. The, as a biome, there are a couple of, as a habitat, there are a couple of uh, features of urban wetlands that, are, that uh, need uh, attention and that is the number of species usually declines of most taxa. And what has declined in the number of species usually is sort of made up by the overabundance of the few taxa that are retained. So you can see that even in urban uh, terrestrial areas where you see pigeons are now taking over bird habitats and, and uh, bird species in cities and we are losing a huge number of species like hornbills and woodpeckers. Similarly, in wetland areas, you will see pond herons and egrets sort of uh, uh, growing in abundance, but you then start to see the complete removal of species like flamingos and uh, other specialized species. And that leads to something known as homogenization in ecology. And uh, you, some of you may be familiar with the work that Aditya did, where we've shown that the homogenization is not restricted to individual sites, but because of the way in which the management is reduced to one or two management styles and one or two land use types, homogenization may occur across taxa, across very, very vast landscapes. And we don't yet really understand what this means for human well-being. Will it really help uh, or will it really completely break down a certain amount of things that were available to us before? And that sort of remains to be seen and again is a fertile ground for, uh, for research. Also what happens because of this uh, uh, homogeneity, I mean the, the reason why this homogeneity happens is the urbanization process and the, uh, the change in uh, the wetland ecology starts to favor generalists. So you begin to find uh, specialists completely vanish and then you begin to find uh, uh, a few species who are able to retain in these, uh, who are able to retain life cycle stuff like breeding successfully and also finding partners or dispersing. They're the only ones who are able to stay there. So as you know, New York is for example, famous for its rats and its sewers. So that's sort of a classical example of what may happen if an urban wetland ecosystem is uh, not taken care of in terms of recharging its ecosystem values. Finally, I'll refer uh, briefly to this uh, sort of a postmodernist vision that's come up with Peter Connolly in Australia, which is very fascinating for uh, trying to uh, include wetlands in our, in our landscapes in urban areas, and that's called landscape urbanism. And what he says about landscape urbanism is uh, interesting, and it sort of points to the question saying, have we come full circle where we have now realized that uh, civilization began in uh, wet areas and therefore we need to really retain those wet areas if we want to continue uh, being as a civilized society. And what he says is that the city of the future will be an infinite series of landscapes. And these landscapes will be physiological and physical. They'll be urban and rural. 
and most importantly, flowing apart and together. So a city is therefore not a tree, but a complete landscape. So urban planners have now realized that you really need to start looking beyond the homogeneity that seems to form uh, because of very specific needs of development, very specific uh, skewed version of what we view as uh, what is necessary for a developed city to now absorbing other qualities which are very, very important both for our general well-being, for the way that we think and for our health as you know, Delhi has now become famous as the most polluted city in the world. And we clearly know that it's not just green areas, but the kind of green areas that are necessary. And therefore, for urban wetlands, it's not just having a water, water body, but the kind of water bodies that will then uh, start to determine how good a city is, uh, even for uh, urban planners. So now the uh, focus has now shifted in very many areas from what we are seeing in India today. If you go to Noida and Gurgaon and Dwarka, it's very obvious, it's verticality. It's uh, let's try and fill up as many people to a horizontality, which is not just spreading out people to semi-urban areas and uh, peri-urban areas, but also a horizontally, horizontality in terms of what we maintain as part of a city explicitly in terms of planning. And urban wetlands are sort of very high up there because of the huge amount of functions that they provide. So I'll uh, leave that for now. There's a huge amount of textbook, textbook type things that can be said, but uh, I'll sort of stop there and then maybe take uh, questions and then hope for a discussion on this.